So welcome uh, to our fourth and final um, session of this series, Equity Conversations, Creating a Community of Belonging. We are thankful that you decided to spend this evening with us and we appreciate your time. Um, this meeting is being recorded and will be captioned and Angelica has sent out fantastic emails with the links to the recordings and all of the additional um, information. And if you've not received those, we'll pop an email in the chat um, to check in with us on that. But again, you're invited to update your display name if you wish to do so with your name and pronouns. At the beginning of each session, we try to have a different question that we um, ask uh, the moderators and ask some of the participants. So before I start, uh, my name is Stephanie Munsterman Scriven, and I am the executive director of the Cedar Rapids Civil Rights Commission. And we welcome you and thank you for being here this tonight. So our question is, um, do you consider yourself an ally, advocate, or activist, and why? And so these are the definitions that we're working off of and so for my answer, I consider myself to be an activist um, in both my professional life as well as my personal life. Um, I work for the Civil Rights Commission, and so um, I work to safeguard freedom um, from discrimination. Um, in my personal life, I volunteer quite a bit in different aspects. So I work to listen to our community. I try to help provide opportunities such as this for us to grow and learn together in in a, in a broader sense, um, I work and I volunteer because my vision, my passion is to create an equitable community where everybody feels they belong. So that is why I chose activist. Angelica. Thank you so much, Stephanie. So my name is Angelica Veneta. I'm the volunteer manager for United Way of East Central Iowa. Um, you know, and as this title states, activism really is a ladder. You can be on one rung at any given time. I'm sure many of us, myself included, find ourselves with one foot on one rung and a different foot on a different rung. And it really depends maybe on the day or even the issue. Um, currently, I would consider myself an activist. I'm really looking to push for cultural competencies and better racial understanding in the workplace. And I serve on the DEI subcommittee at United Way of East Central Iowa, and also along with Stephanie on the executive committee for inclusive ICR. I also serve as the commissioner with Fred on the Marian Civil Rights Commission. Um, you know, and I really make no apologies about holding each of those groups accountable for the work that we're looking to do. Oftentimes, though, I do find myself uh, standing on that advocate rung, especially in spaces where I don't feel like I have my own lived experiences, where I can authentically talk about some of the challenges and barriers that other people might have. So, I mean, in those cases, I feel like I can use my voice to raise awareness and lobby around specific issues, um, and just in general, raise a ruckus about some issues that are really important to me. So thank you guys all for coming, and I will have Carrie introduce herself. Okay, good evening. My name is Carrie Chase. I'm the Director of Community Impact at United Way of East Central Iowa. And my pronouns are she, her, and I would have changed them, but I had to switch technology and I couldn't figure it out. So I apologize. Um, so the question to ally, advocate, or activist, which are you? Um, I had to do some self-reflection. I had to do a little hanging the mirror moments when I was trying to think of my response to this. Um, I came to the conclusion, conclusion one, it's, it's not a matter of should I be doing this, but really how. And then I had to think that what I have learned a year ago to what I've learned six months ago to what I've learned last week or even yesterday really has continued to challenge my thinking. Um, to shift my perceptions and to really evolve my understanding. And so, and I will tell you, I feel like today I've probably shifted my mind frame like two or three more times. So I would like to say, I would hope that I really am an ally um, and that I'm working on being an advocate. So that's kind of when you're talking about the ladder, Angelica, that's where I'm trying to position myself and climb. Uh, 
All right. Uh, my name is Fred Brown. I am the vice chair of the Marion Civil Rights Commission uh, and also a member of the Marion Community Equity Task Force. Uh, I, my pronouns are he and him. Uh, so I consider myself an uh, advocate with all of the community involvement that I'm involved in. Uh, uh, and also an activist. So I, it depends on uh, the certain times and uh, which I'm put into various situations. Uh, there are multiple times where I'm out protesting, actively holding uh, folks accountable, not only in the workplace, but also in the community uh, when it comes to uh, housing and uh, racial justice, when it comes to police pro profiling. I'm definitely on the front lines and uh, being an activist uh, in that manner. So, uh, Part of my role as a civil rights commissioner is to uh, ensure that uh, we are doing uh, things to bring uh, diversity and equity into the city of, uh, of Marion. And uh, like the Cedar Rapids, uh, we are definitely uh, challenged in various areas when it comes to uh, ensuring that we're, all people feel welcomed and uh, fully embraced. Uh, one key initiative that uh, Marion uh, has uh, done to address uh, inequities within the or within the community is to uh, start up or uh, or house a uh, housing grant uh, that particularly serves uh, underserved uh, individuals within uh, the community uh, to help uh, address the inequities in our housing uh, initiative. So we've done that for the last three years, uh, and we're looking to obviously increase uh, funding when it comes to. Uh, addressing those uh, inequities within the community. Uh, obviously, the, the Rachel had a huge impact on our community, uh, and we want to make sure that going forward, uh, that uh, things are definitely just. So, those are a couple of ways that I'm active, uh, actively being an act, uh, an activist in the community. Great, thank you so much, Carrie and Fred. I appreciate the, the thoughtful way in which you answered those questions. Um, next, we just wanna share a few tips for how to have an engaging conversation. Um, as we have said all along, you know, this is the opportunity for us to have a dialogue around experiences or identities that are different than what we have and what we live. And so we are committed to listen deeply, um, committed to learn from one another, we are committed to help one another grow and to learn. And so we do invite a spirit of curiosity, um, having an open mind, open heart. Um, sometimes we hear an experience and it's outside our own. And so it's hard to believe. So I invite you to have the spirit of curiosity and be willing to be uncomfortable. Um, sometimes there might be um, something that's said, um, um, something that's in the chat that might make you feel a little uncomfortable and that is okay. It's okay to feel uncomfortable for a moment. So um, if you wish to do so, we are we do encourage for you to use the chat box as we have been doing so, so far. So thank you so much for sharing um, where you are on that ladder. Again, it's not um, a one time, you know, you as Angelica said, you can certainly have your foot on two rungs at once. Uh, if you do have a question, you're welcome to raise your hand um, or you can type your question into the chat box. But again, biggest thing is being willing to learn and grow with one another. Thank you so much, Stephanie. So now I just wanna take a moment and talk about advocacy in general terms. So, you know, being an intentional participant in change can look different for a lot of us. Um, and over the past year, there have been a lot of opportunities for us to be outspoken activists, advocates, and allies. Um, but I think sometimes we struggle with how we might be personally fitting into driving change. Like we don't know that that really is advocacy. Um, and again, oftentimes we overlook some of the ways that we are indeed advocating for change. So I actually have a poll that I'd like to put up here um, and I need to activate this and show responses. Um, so if you have, I want you to um, go to this site again, pollev.com, U-W-E-C-I 765. You can also text your responses as follows. Um, and select any of the following activities that you participated in the last year. 
I would be curious from our group of 74 participants um, where you feel like you have um, really engaged in advocacy work over the last year. So I'll give that a moment and I will take out my phone and make sure that I'm texting in my answers too um, for participation. And you can certainly uh, text or choose more than one. So if you have participated in all four of these initiatives over the last year, um, please let us know. Like Angelica, I took out my phone and I also participated. And so thank you so much. It's great to see all of the different um, pieces and ways we have participated in our community so far. So thank you so much for sharing. I love seeing all the different things that we've done. Yes, I agree. And I really appreciate that a good majority of us have voted in an election in the last year since we did have um, a very important general election, but there are elections each year or every other year too that are also important for us to be participating in, which is one of the um, most important and perhaps easiest ways of participating in advocacy um, and advocating on behalf of um, the type of community that we want to be living in in the future. So thank you all for participating in our poll. And again, it looks like most of us have at least voted in an election and helped raise awareness by communicating an issue through social media or even by email. Um, and so I just want to go to the next slide um, and really just talk a little bit about how advocating um, manifests itself or shows up in the community. There are really four different areas um, and it consists of a range of activities. Some we might consider more direct, public, outward facing, or others might be more personal, private, and one-on-one. -on -one. And there is no right or wrong way really to advocate for social change or systemic change. Um, and so one of the areas that you may have noticed ties in with education and public awareness. So things like participating in a social media campaign, awareness days, uh, walkathons, those types of events, grassroots mobilization. It seemed like there were still a number of us who participated in protests this past year. Um, if you write a petition, even participating in things such as marches, um, the Million Man March, the Me Too March, those would be examples of grassroots mobilization. And as I mentioned before, civic engagement, either voting yourself or educating others on the importance of voter registration. Um, and then of course, direct lobbying. That goes beyond just um, attending town halls um, you can go to Capitol Hill Days, which I know that the United Way and the Civil Rights Commission both participate in, and certainly meeting with your legislators one-on-one. -on -one. I know that we have um, several local city um, and state government officials that are participating in these calls, and I'm sure that they welcome um, your voice as a constituent to hear about what are the things that are important to you. Um, so again, as we sort of determine how we could each be a part of driving change and addressing inequities, we can also just consider what level of engagement um, fits our values, our bandwidth, the time that we have, capacity, and even our comfort level. Um, so again, we just wanted to take a brief moment to share with you the different ways that you can be engaged as an advocate. So with that, I want to actually pass it over to Carrie Chase. Um, again, she is with United Way of East Central Iowa, and she's going to be talking a little bit about the community impact assessment work that United Way does and how it can help inform things such as public policy and ways that we can address inequities in our community. Carrie? Great, thank you. So we were talking um, before everyone got on that if anything's gonna happen, it's gonna be with me talking. And I'm telling you, my cat is ready to pounce on my setup here. So it could happen. So if it does, we're gonna roll with it. And uh, I apologize already. 
Um, so I'm going to talk about our community impact assessment that we um, have decided to do with United Way of East Central Iowa. And it was really interesting when I was going through and kind of thinking through what I wanted to talk about and being able to link it back to actually the ally advocate activist and the reflection and the learning. Um, you know, when we started this process about six months ago, it was going to be a community needs assessment. Um, uh, historically, a community needs assessment is a snapshot of our community. Uh, this could be a survey, it could be a strategy, it could be policy, funding, many, many others, demographics, all those kinds of things. And it's typically done to understand what services and resources are most needed in the community. And that's really where we thought we were going. We said it had been a while, it's, it's time for us to do this. It's going to set us up um, in a great place to be able to um, have a new funding cycle. Simple, easy, done, right? And then um, as 2020 unfolded and we were hit by a pandemic and George Floyd's death and a derecho, um, the, the community needs assessment evolved. Our, our thinking was really challenged in what we were doing and our, percep our perception shifted. I don't know if you can see him, he's biting me, sorry. <laughs> so what I, I, I won't bore you with the long process that it took to get to where we got, but we knew that we have been flexible and we reimagined really this community needs assessment into a community impact assessment. And there's really four different elements that I wanna just talk through and how our lens has changed a little bit on each of these. So the first is really looking at our data. And so, you know, historically, we've done a really good job of looking at our region, county specific, looking at those population level indicators. And we've even really kind of started to drill down a little bit. Um, but what we want to get to with our data, for example, is if we're to look at our high school graduates for the Cedar Rapids School District, why is there a 10% increase? from whites to non-whites students graduating high school. So it's just, you know, if we're looking at inequities, that's a great example of one. That's one that we're able to drill down and see why is that? Why is that with COVID that one out of 32 white Lynn County residents have had, have um, excuse me, contracted COVID while, while one in 18 black residents have. So again, those, those are the things that we want to be able to drill down and have a better understanding of and looking at our data. It's also going to show us where we have the gaps in our data. What is it that we don't know that we need to know? What are the other populations we need to look closely at? And what are the, the, the other big level um, data points that we're able to do? So data is kind of our first element. Our second element is um, doing a survey. Um, we really, there's two things we want to do with our, with our survey is that we want to give voice to every member of our community. We want to shed light on the needs and the barriers by those who are experiencing them. So, um, I think we have done a really good job in, um, understanding our community and understanding our donor perspective from United Way and really where their interests and where their investments lie. Um, but we have opportunity now to give voice to everybody. And that was really important. Um, the other part of that is that has evolved in not just giving voice to everybody, but in partnership. So when we primarily started the survey process, it was, you know, kind of a three person show. We were just going to figure out and we were going to go with it. And along the way, we've had great collaborations. And so for Lynn County, we have, um, we have Lynn County and we have the city of Cedar Rapids who are both actively evolved. And now instead of doing three separate surveys, we're collaborating and we're doing one survey, which I think is just phenomenal and I'm really excited about. Um, we also have really had to look at how we're going to look at the differences between our more rural areas and our more urban areas. So how we're going to outreach and, you know, we're still really building a lot of relationships and connections in some of our other counties and our rural areas. So how are we going to make sure that we're getting their voice as well? Um, the second point is that um, the data that we're co collecting is not real time. Sometimes you're relying on two year census data, for whatever it might be. So 
there's a lot that has happened in the last year that we want to be able to capture. And so again, it's really important to be able to provide that survey as a way to get that feedback and to have that targeted um, outreach. Uh, the second piece that we really plan on doing with the survey is if we get results and we understand that there is a population that is underrepresented, we know that we need to do a more targeted approach or more targeted focus groups or whatever we can do to help um, ensure everybody gets voice and um, has access to be able to do this. Um, the third uh, element is our community solutions. And so one of the things that I wanna make sure that we highlight is that we have great things going on in our community. We have great coalitions, we have great community organizations, um, um, community committees, all those great things. Um, what I would like to do is make sure that we know who they are, um, how they're most aligned with what United Way represents and what we stand for, which is the education, financial stability, and health of everybody. Um, I also want to know, do they feel like they're succeeding? And if they're not, what other support do they need? We also need to make sure that we're getting a, a good representation of these and make sure we're including a lot of our grassroots movements that are doing really important work as, much, as well as, you know, a lot of tried and true um, committees and coalitions that are out there. And the fourth um, is our funding. And so we know that we have a lot of varied funding that comes into our community. We know that our nonprofits who are response, who have the response to a lot of the work that we're doing um, have braided funding, which means they're using multiple funding sources. And so we just wanna be able to do a really thorough analysis of what this is and an understanding. Um, and when I talk about things being fluid and changing um, just today, <laughs> it happened again. Um, we have been trying to partner with, um, well, we have been partnering with Mount Mercy um, to uh, have one of their um, student interns be able to work specifically on part of our community um, assessment, impact assessment. And we, um, unfortunately, the, the individual that was supposed to wasn't able to. So we were able to do a quick meet and greet today and see if another student was able to. And she was willing and she wanted to. And um, I'm super excited because she's a senior who um, is also an immigrant and is just going to bring a whole different lens um, into the conversations that we're having. And so one of the things that I added to her um, to her study was if she would make sure as we're looking through our investment strategies as a united way, she feels that we are being equitable as well. So um, that just happened today. So we're constantly kind of moving and shaking and adjusting. Um, I think what we know overall is that a lot of families and individuals have very interconnected needs and we need to have interconnected solutions. We can't rely on isolated interventions of just one organization. We need to work together. Um, so our, our hope is that um, we're gonna be able to um, kind of um, help that pathway along a little bit. Um, what we want to do with this community impact um, assessment, and honestly, this could again, continue to really evolve is we wanna be the catalyst um, we, we wanna build the foundation to really catalyze efforts um, to achieve community impact. And what I mean by this is that we wanna, we wanna provide the, the conversation material, right? To have uh, conversations around advocacy, around systems change, around, around our uh, funding decisions, around other funding decisions, whatever those might be, that's what we're really hoping. Um, we know that this community impact assessment is not going to give us all the answers. It's not what we're looking for. What we're really hoping is it's going to spur the conversations to invite the possibilities. So thank you everybody for um, listening and for putting up with my killer cat for the time being. <laughs> Thank you so much, Carrie. Um, again, the collaborations that are stemming from these conversations are really so critical in order for us to be able to make a true 
authentic um, and deep impact, I think, on the change that we want to see in our community. There certainly have been a lot of grassroots efforts that have arisen um, over the past year, and Fred is going to talk about um, some of the work that he's been doing in Marion with the Community Equity Task Force, but then also some of the work that we're looking to do as part of the Marion Civil Rights Commission. And then I know Stephanie is also going to be sharing some work that the Cedar Rapids Civil Rights Commission is doing. So I will toss it on to Fred. Um, and then, Carrie, we may have open it up for questions in a little bit. So hang tight and we will allow people to um, ask questions and certainly anybody can drop those in the chat box and the moderators can ask the questions but we will allow the participants to unmute themselves soon as well so fred thanks angelica so uh everyone's world has been turned upside down since last march when you look at covid and uh obviously in the june time frame with uh george floyd uh situation as well and so as a the civil rights commission uh was uh pondering how do we respond uh to uh these ideas so uh one group in the city of Marion that was uh, created or formed as a result of uh, the protest was the Marion equal uh Marion racial for eco alliance uh, alliance group uh that group uh basically had a bunch of demands that basically uh challenged the city of marion to uh do more and to uh yeah, yes marion uh, alliance for racial equity thank you for for that uh it, it challenged us to do more uh as a community so uh they uh, that group actually came to the Marion Civil Rights Commission meeting uh, multiple times to partner and to lay out their plan. And we uh, aligned with most of their uh, and adopted most of their ideas, uh, as well as when they went to the uh, city council to uh, present uh, their thoughts on how can we become a more uh, equitable uh, group uh, for the community. So. Uh, as a result, uh, the Marion uh, Civil Rights Commission uh, recommended and showed and took various actions over the course of multiple months to engage not only with the police chief, but with the, the mayor uh, on various actions. So uh, the, uh, the police chief came to the uh, Civil Rights Commission meeting uh, a few times and presented his police data in regards to the various stops uh, and the interactions between the police and the citizens of the community. Uh, one thing that became apparent through uh, those discussions was uh, the need for more transparency. And uh, the, the police uh, chief was uh, very transparent and very willing to let the Civil Rights Commission uh, into uh, his world and the police world. Uh, one of the things that uh, was that became a result or an end result was the, the thought that there was a need to add a mental health uh, crisis person to the police force to help address some of the uh, mental health uh, crisis and stops uh, that was occurring. So the Civil Rights Commission has uh, done a, a fabulous job of partnering not only with the mayor, but the police chief on uh, next, uh, next level uh, steps to help address uh, ec uh, racial profiling within the community. Uh, as the Civil Rights Commission, as I mentioned earlier, the Civil Rights Commission uh, has a, a ton of initiatives. And one of our main uh, goals as a commission is to educate the community. So activism is a, a huge part of what we're looking to do uh, going forward. Uh, obviously with COVID that uh, was difficult and tough because most of our activities were mostly in person. And so I know Civil, uh, Cedar Rapids as well as um, Marion has had to adjust and shift their strategy for community activism and uh, outreach. So one thing that the commission is planning on doing going forward is to re-engage with the community. So a couple of things that uh, we have on uh, deck is to have more community conversations uh, via Zoom uh, th which will be starting up here uh, within the next uh, few months or so, as well as uh, just uh, hearing from the, uh, the community via surveys and other uh, activities. Some of uh, most of these uh, actions that the Civil Rights Commission will be leading are aligned to the uh, to the uh, Community Equity Task Force that the City of Marion uh, is leading as well. The three major policy uh, or three major actions or areas in which the Marion uh, Community Equity Task Force is tasked at addressing are uh, policy, 
practice and perceptions. So there are perceptions uh, that uh, you know, Marion uh, historically hasn't been as inviting to a diverse uh, people group. There was a survey that was uh, held around the time that the Rachel uh, w w uh, hit, which was last fall, that uh, indicated and validated those concerns amongst uh, various diverse people groups. So the equ uh, Equity Task Force will be addressing uh, those issues as we continue uh, to push forward. So uh, we're still in the forming stages on uh, which actions we're going to go and uh, tackle first, but uh, be on the lookout for our next steps here shortly. Great. Thanks so much for sharing, Fred. And I appreciate the work that Mary is doing um, in the community the, between the, the task force and the commission. It's exciting to see um, these conversations moving forward and some action coming out of that. As I mentioned at the very beginning, I'm with the Cedar Rapids Civil Rights Commission and uh, just wanted to touch base with you about a few things that we have going on. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, um, you know, the theme of this series is creating a community of belonging. And um, I want to be clear on the definition of belonging um, because sometimes people are on different pages, but belonging um, means more than just being seen. It entails having a voice, a meaningful voice and the opportunity to uh, participate um, in the design of social and cultural structures. And it means the right to have contributions to um, and make demands on society as well as political institutions. It's more than just feeling included. Um, sometimes people think of um, belonging or inclusivity is you are joining something that's already there. Uh, you're arriving as a guest. Um, you can join my organization, you can join my school. Um, but it's mine and you come with a structure already in place. But then you as the joiner um, are oftentimes a member of a marginalized or oppressed group and you're expected to assimilate. You're expected to make the accommodations to fit into this new thing. Um, belonging goes outside of that. There's no boundaries in belonging. Um, it suggests that when you join something, you participate and you co-create. And so you have the power and standing to do that. So you're not joining as a guest, you're joining as something that is a co-creation and it becomes our thing. Um, it becomes our circle of concern um, collectively. And so creating a community of belonging has long been my vision and it will continue to be so. And uh, one question I'm often asked, especially uh, more so since um, the murder of George Floyd last summer, um, how do I get involved with the Civil Rights Commission? Um, what do I do? So I wanted to just highlight a few upcoming community events, um, some of which are still in the works and we will be happy to share you know, the logistics and the details once those are tapped down. Um, but I do want to invite you to our monthly commission meetings. Um, they are held um, virtually still, uh, those are the third Wednesday of each month, starting at 5.30, and they are streamed on the City of Cedar Rapids Facebook page, and I'm going to drop that link in the, in the chat, so that way you have access to see that. Um, we just continue to stream that on that page. Um, if people wish to um, speak, they are welcome to do that. Thank you for popping that in there. Um, and so you're welcome to participate in those. Um, a couple of things coming up. Um, March is Women's History Month. And so in order to honor and celebrate that month, the Civil Rights Commission will be hosting um, a toiletries and hygiene drive. Um, we're collecting items for the Catherine McCauley Center Women's Services. Um, sometimes we can take these things for granted, but tampons and pads and chapstick and diapers and um, textured hair products, those are expensive. And sometimes that's an expense that are on women who don't have the means to pay for them. This is also called the pink tax. Um, you probably have heard that. Um, but this is something we're going to be doing that the last two weeks in March. 
and we'll be sharing out um, the locations for that drive. Um, also coming up, as we did with the documentary uh, 13th, uh, we'll be hosting another virtual movie discussion with the focus on women. Um, we are still typing that down. We would like this time around to have an opportunity for adults as well as youth. Um, I don't know about you, but I love listening to our youth. Um, they are, um, sometimes people say that they're our future and I argue that they are our now. And so we need to listen to their wisdom um, now and implement what they're teaching us, um, us adults who, who oftentimes think we know everything, but truly we don't. So we will certainly share that. And the March commission meeting is March 17th. And I invite you to that. Um, Jana DeBejo Parker is our senior investigator and mediator, and she will be doing a presentation on uh, mediation, um, restorative justice, and dispute resolution. So you're invited to attend that. Um, coming up in April, April is Fair Housing Month. And again, going back to the theme for youth, we are hosting our sixth annual art contest for the youth. And um, the theme this year is um, home and belonging, um, what home means to me. And so um, this competition is open to all Cedar Rapids students. Um, we, we, since we are Cedar Rapids um, department um, and commission, that is our jurisdiction. But this is for students kindergarten through 12th grade, um, including students who are not US um, citizens, students who are virtual learners, students who are homeschooled, um, your, your participation is invited. And there'll be four groups, um, K through second, three through five, six through eight, and nine through 12. And the winners will receive um, money towards post-secondary. So a thousand for first, 500 for second, and 250 for third. And so the contest deadline is April 1st. And I'm gonna drop um, just a little bit of information about that in the chat as well including a link to where you can get details about um, the actual contest and how you can submit entries. Um, we will be doing some fun events. Oops, I just sent it only to Angelica. Let me send that to everybody. There we go. So those are the details of how you can get involved. Um, your kids are welcome to do that. We have sent that out to schools, community organizations, um, to everybody, so you're welcome to share that. Um, another thing that we're working on is creating some videos in multiple languages. Um, many of our materials are in multiple languages, um, but they're all written. And so we want to have some videos about how, how to file a complaint um, so people can you know, know their rights, know their responsibilities. And uh, we work with Catherine McCauley to kind of determine what top five languages there are other than English. And those are French, Spanish, um, Swahili, um, Lagila, Karundi. And so we're hoping that this will assist people in understanding um, their rights. And those are going to be released in April as well. Um, also in process, someone asked about micro biases, and that's a great question. So we are already, we're also working on some storytelling videos um, of immigrants and refugees who will share their lived authentic experiences of what is it like to live here in our community as an immigrant, as a refugee? What does that look like? What does it feel like? What are their experiences? And those are to be released in June. Um, June 20th is World Refugee Day. And so that's kind of our, um, our goals to have those released by then. Um, one other quick thing is um, May. Um, as you can tell, there's a theme. We have a theme for each month. Um, and so it's um, important because we want to keep these conversations going. We People are showing up. And so we want to keep that interest sparked. And so very much like Fred, keep those conversations going. Um, so May is um, Asian and Pacific Islander month. And so we're working on um, some books, um, like a book study, and potentially also a graphic novel for some folks who don't like books, but they prefer a graphic novel. Um, we would like to provide that for youth as well as adults as possible. Um, and one thing to keep in mind is, you know, for the movie nights, we try to find um, things that are easily accessible. So you don't have to have a subscription to Amazon Prime or to Hulu. We try to find things that are free to the public. 
as well as the books. If someone wants to participate, we are very happy to purchase the books for you. Um, so if you have any questions, um, you're welcome to reach out to me. Um, you also can uh, connect with us on um, Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, and I'm going to pop those links in the chat as well. So you're welcome to reach out to us. Um, we, Kelly Himmer is our administrative assistant, and she has taken over social media, and she is phenomenal. And so if you haven't looked at our um, social media just yet, I, I encourage you to do so. I learn something every day. Um, from the postings that she puts out there. So those are a few things coming up. Um, I'm not going to go too much further. We have uh, additional months, but we appreciate, um, you know, any uh, participation from everybody in this conversation. And so this moves us, you know, into the next segment. Um, it's almost like we planned this, Angelica. <laughs> um, so we move in, how can we uh, make a difference? Um, how can we use our hearts and our mind and our voice to create transformational change? Uh, we often hear that there's so many issues and so many concerns and they don't know where to start. Um, where do I begin? Um, how can I make a difference? There's just so much and I get it. So let's pause, take a breath, and take a moment to think through those issues. Think about what you are concerned about. What keeps you up at night or wakes you up in the morning? Um, what would you like to change? What are you excited about? And then what control or influence do you have to make a difference? So now I invite you to take out a piece of paper or um, whatever you use to write on. Because um, I know there's some, oh, what are those called? They're actually like, you can um, wipe them off and it's very environmentally friendly, rocket books, rocket books. Um, so we invite you to do either draw circles or write, um, or write a list answering these questions. So first we're gonna talk about your sphere of equity control. As you'll see, that's in the middle on this page. Think about what it is you truly have control over um, what are the issues? What are the um, arenas you can make a decision um, and change that on your own? So think about that for a moment. What are some things, uh, a couple examples in this include my ideology um, and my homework policy. You know, this for a student, you know, do I, when do I do homework? Do I do it like right after school? Do I do it, do I give myself a break? So what is, what are a few things that are with your own sphere of control? And after we go through this process a little bit, we will invite you to share your answers um, a little bit. So what is it that you have um, the ability to in, have control over? I'll give you a couple of mo moments to think, because I know it's, it's hard to think of things sometimes. There's just so much. And then in your second circle or your second list, that is the sphere of influence. What do you have influence over? Um, what, um, perhaps you don't have control, um, but you can influence by advocating for change or organizing for change or educating people. What can you influence? What is it within that um, area? A few examples in, the, in this bubble include school tardy policy and school culture. Um, this person um, feels that they're able to um, influence um, some policies around culture, around tardy um, school po policy. Um, so thinking about that, what are some areas in which you might have the ability to um, influence? And Angelica told us several ways in which we can do that from the, the grassroots to lobbying, um, there's multiple ways. Then next, just take a moment to perhaps um, identify one thing, um, just one, um, that is within your sphere of control. Um, what are things that come to mind and ways in which you can address that? Would it be education and public awareness, uh, the grassroots mobilization, um, civic engagement or direct lobbying are a few ways. 
what is one way in which you can perhaps make a difference in that sphere of equity control? And this is an exercise that I would encourage you to look back on on a re pretty regular basis because as, as we change our areas of um, concern change and even our ability to have control or influence, we can step in and out of those circles based upon our um, circumstances, our jobs where we live. Um, so I encourage you to look at this um, on a pretty regular basis. And then for your sphere of influence, let's do the same thing. How, pick one thing, um, one inequity that exists within that sphere of influence and how you ins assert your influence to address that. What are some potential steps you can take to make some influence um, within the inequities that are in that part of the bubble or your list? And you are certainly invited to, I see some people are putting it in the chat. You're certainly invited to put your thoughts into the chat. Um, if people like to share their thoughts um, on video, you're welcome to do so as well. As Stephanie mentioned, um, feel free to put your answers in the chat box here and we will have a chance um, after we do our breakout conversations to come back into the large group and share some of these thoughts and ideas that you've had um, during those breakout sessions. Um, so again, feel free to put those in the chat and share them in your small groups. Um, so we'll just give you a few more minutes um, to sort of fill in your circles or a piece of paper. Um, and then we'll kind of talk a little bit about some additional ways that we can engage um, in sort of the civic work that we're doing. All right. So um, again, Stephanie was talking a little bit about, you know, how do we assert our influence to address some of these issues that we feel are extremely important to us? Um, and what I just wanted to take a moment to share with each of you is the Civic Circle Framework from Points of Light. United Way of East Central Iowa is a member of the Points of Light Network, um, which is essentially a consortium of organizations that are dedicated to taking action to solve problems. Um, we work to connect people with opportunities to be engaged. So that's certainly the volunteer engagement um, component, but also helping people discover their potential to make a difference. You know, We believe that every action matters um, and that this engagement is critical to advancing some of the causes that you feel um, are important. Um, and so recently Points of Light came out with this civic circle framework really um, just designed to be able to do just that, to um, lend your support, to take action for those causes. And there's nine different components. Um, and again, these are the things that we would love you to be thinking about as we move into the next section with the breakout session. Um, so the areas that Points of Light and United Way talk about for civic engagement include volunteerism. So lending your time and talent to causes that you care about, um, the other area is purchase power. I think recently we've heard a lot more about patronizing black owned businesses or women led organizations. So making decisions that reflect your values um, with where you spend your money, right? Um, voting, again, we continue to talk about how that is a critical component um, to the political process. Um, this includes the national elections, but mm -hmm. I would say that our local city government and school board elections much more directly impact every aspect of our life. So we highly encourage you to get out and make sure that you're voting and to educate others. Um, the other area is work. Um, again, just the individual's ability to make employment decisions based on the value of your employer. Um, there was an article that came out 
recently from Washington Post, um, just this week actually, that said that younger job seekers, um, for them, diversity inclusion isn't just a preference, it's an absolute requirement. They're gonna be asking questions about inclusivity in the workplace um, to see whether or not they feel comfortable in that space. Um, another area, of course, is voice, which we continue to talk about um, and is a fairly easy thing to do to influence your family, friends, and others, either through social media, certainly signing a petition. Um, you know, when you see something, say something. That's sort of that mentality that we're looking at there when we talk about using your voice. Um, donating, of course, contributing um, goods and services to advance any causes that you feel particularly um, important to you. Listening and learning. I mean, that's essentially what this entire equity series is about. Um, you know, participating in conversations um, such as this, maybe even listening to a podcast about differently abled people, but just recognizing the need to think critically um, and be informed before we act, but just listening to perspectives that are different than your own. Um, another area is service. Um, so again, just committing your time and energy and talent to a greater good, perhaps holding office, military service, volunteering for the AmeriCorps, even our jury duty service um, is critically important to creating a community in which we want to live in. Um, and the last area that is on this uh, civic circle framework is to be a social entrepreneur. Um, if you identify a need that hasn't been met by traditional systems, what are some innovative solutions that you can think of that can help drive some of the change? So again, we just encourage you to keep these nine components in the back of your mind, the things that we've talked about with the sphere of equity influence um, and the advocacy exercise that we did earlier, as we encourage you to be thinking about ways that you can yourself specifically engage in this work to create change. Um, so I just want to, I know that there were some questions in the chat box that we certainly want to um, try to answer as we have time before we get into our breakout discussion. So um, I do know one of the last questions before I started speaking was in reference to the um, community assessment. And so Carrie, I think they were asking um, when the assessment would be available and how people can participate in uh, the survey. Great question. Um, so the survey we're hoping will be out in two weeks. Um, we're kind of, um, it's completed and we're building it now. Um, so we will be calling on a lot of our partners to be able to help us distribute that um, as well as some other networks. But I would look at least two to three weeks, the survey will be out. We will have it um, up for about a month. Um, and the hope is, is that we'll have some completed analysis by um, July 1, and then we'll be able to really spend the next fiscal year using our some of our findings to um, propel the, the conversations that we want to have. Thank you so much, Carrie. Um, I'm not sure if there were some additional questions in the chat box. I'm just scrolling through here. Um, Stephanie, I think that there was a question I, um, as you were speaking from the Civil Rights Commission, just um, if there are, let's see, I need to scroll back to that. So um, commissions that represent Black populations um, and maybe obtain strength to truly combat anti-Black racism, you know, when might that be? I think maybe another important thing to share is just the jurisdiction that the Civil Rights Commission has and how we may or may not be able to make um, an impact maybe as this is being um, asked here. Right, that's a really good question. And I, um, I also invite any thoughts on that from uh, the person who asked, asked that question. I always enjoy listening to people um, and getting their opinions and ideas. Um, Angelica is correct. We are um, governed by an ordinance, um, Chapter 69 in Cedar Rapids, and that is our jurisdiction in which um, we are um, able to investigate complaints of discrimination within Cedar Rapids. Uh, we educate and um, do outreach in our community, things like this tonight. Um, we mediate complaints of 
discrimination. Um, we do try um, to offer different uh, points of view um, in which we truly actively combat discrimination and combat the anti-Black um, point of view. Uh, we have held some discussions in the past um, where we read Kendi's book, How to Be an, um, an Anti-Racist, as well as um, the book, So You Want to Talk About Race. Um, so we try to provide those opportunities for people to engage with one another about those things. Um, but I'm open to um, other people's thoughts on ways in which we can do that. I also do want to mention um, Cedar Rapids, and I will pop this into the chat as well, um, are seeking uh, participants um, to be on the Citizens Review Board. We recently passed an ordinance to, to create one, and they're looking for um, people to be on that. And so let me put that in the chat as well. I, I would be remiss if I didn't include that um, as another way in which people can engage with the community. Um, but that is uh, for uh, community members to um, work with one another around um, you know, police accountability and um, reviewing those items. But again, um, my contact information is in the chat. Um, I can put it in there again, because I think it kind of got um, way up top, but here's information about the Citizens Review Board. So you can, if you're interested, um, they're accepting applications for quite some time still. And then I will um, also put my contact information in there again. Well, I believe those are all the questions that I saw in the chat box. So if you do have any other questions, feel free to type those in, or I have given you permission to raise your hand and um, we can unmute you and you can either share anything that you would like to share, or if you have a question for any of our presenters. So next we're going to start going into breakouts in which we can have a conversation around um, things that we are able to do. And the discussion questions are on this slide and those will be broadcasted to you. So uh, you can either do a screenshot if you want. Um, sometimes I do that to make sure I don't forget them. Um, but uh, a few things to keep in mind, of course, is we invite you to have you know, an open mind in these conversations. Um, and sharing the air. Uh, just remember that other people want to speak just as much as you want to speak. And so we want to make sure everybody has the same opportunity. Um, and please share your thoughts. It's okay to have um, a differing of opinions. And so this is a space for us to do that. So the questions that we will share via broadcasting um, include the ones that are on your screen, but um, one is what are some major barriers or challenges that you see in overcoming these inequities? Um, we ask you and invite you to discuss opportunities and ideas for you to address those inequities, to empower others and to impact um, social change. And we're always looking for ideas um, for what podcasts, movies, books, other resources do you recommend for future learning? Um, always open to that. Um, I have a very large stack of books that I am I'm still diving into. And then this is the question we have in all of our sessions. In what ways can you um, help to create a sense of belonging? So with that, we'll start going to the breakout rooms and those are the questions that we'll share. Um, at the end, we'll come back in and have an opportunity to share just a little bit, but um, I'll see you in a moment. And if no one shares, I'll have to be picking on our uh, presenters and moderators because I think that several of them were in different groups. Um, hey, Angelica, I'd be happy to share from our group. Please. Thank you so much. You bet. Jeff Kulbeck, CR32, he, him, his. Um, our group talked about education quite a bit and the need to become educated, particularly about people who aren't like you 
And, and that's kind of a major barrier in finding those educational opportunities, um, but, but something that we could all do to try and address those inequities is just to continue to educate yourself. And I think one of the books that um, we recommended was one that's been mentioned previously was How to Be an Anti-Racist. Thank you so much, Jeff. Um, that is a very incredible book. I think one of the things that um, we would like to continue to do is to keep this list of books and recommendations for additional learning updated. It looks like suddenly a bunch of uh, recommendations were dropped into the chat box. And I know that the Cedar Rapids Civil Rights Commission has a list of articles, books, and podcasts. So thank you so much, Jeff, for sharing um, what you chatted about in your group. Are there any others who would like to share what you discussed in your group? Also, if I recognize your face and I know you, I might also call on each of you. I'm flipping through the faces because I don't get an opportunity to do this very often and I'm so pleased with who I see. Um, but I will just ask Fred, is there anything in your group that you would like to share that was discussed? Sure, so we discussed uh, a couple of uh, barriers to uh, addressing inequalities. One of the main uh, issues that came up was how do we combat misinformation and uh, within our children, within our communities and with communicating with loved ones that are uh, have different or opposing views that than we do. And so uh, we talked about uh, different ways. Some recommendations that we came up with were uh, communication, uh, using facts, uh, trying to combat and stay on message. I did make the recommendation of uh, in the city of uh, Des Moines, uh, the, their Civil Rights Commission did a, an exercise called Breaking Bridge, uh, Breaking Bread and Building Bridges, which I think is a phenomenal uh, YouTube video that I put into the uh, to the link. Uh, if you take a, a opportunity and watch that, I think uh, I'm going to recommend that the city of Marion uh, do a similar activity once we're able to get back in person. But that's a great uh, exercise that basically tells us that 90% of the the items that uh, we discuss or have discussions with with others are normally common and that we just disagree on the 10% of the item. So we have more in common with the, uh, with others than we uh, know. So that's a, another great resource. Uh, and so uh, that's kind of what our group discussed. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Fred, for sharing. I feel like the thoughts and some of the ideas that are coming from these conversations are things that Stephanie and I are going to end up working on soon anyhow, but we certainly appreciate the collaboration and support from all of our community members. I'm gonna put a poll up on the screen, but I'm still going to continue to ask for some feedback from the individual breakout sessions. Um, it looks like Carrie Chase, you were in room number two. Carrie, would you like to share a little bit about what you guys discussed in your group? Sure, so um, I definitely don't know if I'll be as eloquent in sharing as Fred was, but I think one of the things that really um, was really poignant to me that kind of stuck with me was, there was two things. There was really good shared experiences that I appreciated um, from different perspectives as to what it was like to live in, in Cedar Rapids and, um, have to um, face some adversity. And then there was also some solutions, which I appreciate on my journey that um, they can be simple. You know, it doesn't have to be a, a grand gesture. It can be a really simple, um, simple gesture. So I think those were some, we had great discussion um, and um, I'm really thankful that people felt really comfortable sharing their experiences and, um, were willing to, to speak. I feel like we had really limited dead time and dead space. It was very filled up with good conversation. So thank you. That's wonderful. Um, you know, I think sometimes these 10 minutes, um, we get a little bit nervous that it will be a lot of dead time and we won't know what to talk about, especially if um, you don't know the other participants who are in this session. But it's so great to hear that everybody felt comfortable enough to be 
uh, brave in sharing their own lived experiences and just being truthful about the ways in which they think we can make this change. Um, again, there continues to be some recommendations in the chat and we'll be compiling all of that. If you don't receive my follow-up emails, um, I do include a transcript of the chat along with active links. Um, I'm just gonna ask for a volunteer from our um, one of our other groups, I'm not sure, Jessica uh, Haraney, you were in group four, and I feel like I heard your voice just as we were getting back in. So Jessica, are you able to share a little bit about what you chatted in your session? Sure, and actually, I mean, I not to like pass the buck, but I really feel like Jerry uh, should share what he shared with our room, or maybe Steve, because they did both an excellent job of sharing their background and perspectives of volunteering. And um, so I'm going to recap what you said, but Jerry and Steve, please jump in and, and add if I, you know, misspeak what you shared. But, um, you know, I think in common with the group that talked about just other people's perceptions or misinformation, right? And how do you help influence those people or help them, you know, understand the truth and data. That was one of the barriers we had shared. Um, another barrier was just, um, how do you get people connected to these types of things where you actually have these learning opportunities, right? And, um, you know, it seems like we were surrounded with like-minded people that want to go make a difference, but how are we connecting with the people that are in the other group, right? Potentially that aren't aware or don't acknowledge that inequities exist. Um, so that was one of the things that we talked about. And, um, you know, Steve shared his experience with, <laughs> you know, we can show up at these meetings, but we gotta, we gotta talk the talk and walk the walk, right? Like, um, so don't just, you know, raise your hand and say, I'm an ally and then go about our day and never touch it again, right? How do we continue to stay active? How do we hold those people that we elect accountable for following through with the, the promises and the actions they said they would take when they, you know, wanted to represent us. So those were the things that we discussed in our group. And then <laughs> when we came back to the room, we were just starting to talk about, well, what can we do about it? And that's when I raised my hand to speak and we ran out of time, so. Thank you so much, Jessica. Steve or Jerry from your group, you are welcome to unmute yourself and share if there's anything additional that you would like to add. It sounds like you had a really great conversation in your group. Um, this is Steve, and I, the, the little that I can add, because uh, Jessica did a good job of recapping what we talked about, but there is a need to be concerned about transparency. Um, and in doing that, um, there are a lot of people, and first, let me, let, me, let me preface this, there are a lot of good people in the Cedar Rapids, Marion area. I'm, I'm not discounting that, but there is a group of folks who who will only say the things they need to say to get elected, to get on a board, get on a commission, get their name somewhere. And then when they leave, they go off in their own little sheltered area of folks who are look like them, talk like them, act like them. And that's who they really are. That's how their kids are gonna be raised. And so when the alarm clock goes off, in the morning at seven, they get ready for work and now they've transferred themselves to this other person. And so we have that going on in this area. There are people who are not genuine. And the problem with that is that a lot of folks, people of color, people uh, with disabilities, people of gender, they see through that. So there is a lack of trust a lot of times that one has to deal with. And you need to have that because the whole part about this change is open and honest conversation. How do I understand what's going on? Just because you don't see it doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. And if I tell you it exists, it's how my perception and how I've interacted and you may never see it. So, we really have to be open and then you need to communicate that with others who you run into. So, but anyway, that's all. Jerry had a pretty good point about some of the uh, activities that are going on and, um, and being part of that. So being, getting involved is, is a good thing, but you need to be sincere about it. Yeah, thank you, Steve. Uh, this is Jerry. 
uh, what I pointed out was that people should recognize that to become stakeholders, and they all should want to be, realize the blueprints in front of the community right now. An example I used was the Safe, Equitable, and Thriving Community Task Force. It's a result of six years of progress toward goals. And the pandemic has really uh, put a crimp in all that. But maybe this is a breakout year and we can be become more um, acquainted with the, the challenges and, and become stakeholders in that. I don't want to hog any more of the conversation, but uh, set safe, equitable, and thriving communities. That's a good example. Thank you so much, Steve, Jerry, and Jessica for sharing. Um, I have worked with Steve at the Marion Civil Rights Commission and Jessica, and I know that they are both very authentic in their um, desire to create equitable spaces for all minoritized communities. And I agree that um, we need to hold each other accountable. Again, that goes back to whether or not we see ourselves as an activist, an ally, or an advocate. Um, so thank you guys for sharing that. Um, you know, and it is key. The framework is there for us. It's we just need to be willing to um, step into that space. And as we've said before, hold other people accountable. So some of you have responded to our final polling question, which is what is something you are committing to future um, to further your learning or take action on regarding equity and social change? And I love to see these responses. Again, to take a step back and make space for folks who have been marginalized. Um, direct lobbying on some concerning current legislation, uh, being able to follow up uh, on a letter that you wrote. Again, I think the uh, message here is accountability, not only for the people who we are asking to be a force of this change, but certainly to ourselves, right? Um, to read and get involved, to promote different community engagements, um, lifting up voices who don't naturally receive the mic. Um, I think that I, before we pass it over to Stephanie, um, if any of you guys were following along in the chat, Ashley, um, Councilman or Councilperson Van Orney had to leave a little bit early, but I think she put it so well in that um, our advocacy, um, our allyship or activism doesn't end at 8 p.m. tonight. We continue to uh, work for all of the change that we hope to see further um, in this community. So again, thank you all for participating um, in our polling questions um, and in each of our individual conversations. I will uh, pass it on to Stephanie to end with any additional parting words. Thank you, Angelica. Just another thank you to all of the people who participated tonight and any of the other sessions. And we do invite you to continue to uh, work in any way that you see fit to create um, equity in our community. Um, someone in my group mentioned it can just be a small, a small thing of who you're inviting to your conversations and having a bigger circle of concern, um, having a bigger we. And so we invite you to um, continue to have conversations with one another. Uh, we will be providing uh, additional opportunities in the future with between um, the different commissions and uh, feel free to reach out to us with questions. But again, thank you so much for your time and for sharing. Uh, we love seeing all of the participation and all of the questions and great um, dialogue that comes out of these. So thank you and stay warm. And Move on past eight o'clock. So we gotta talk the talk and walk the walk, right? Like, um, so don't just, you know, raise your hand and say, I'm an ally and then go about our day and never touch it again, right? How do we continue to stay active? How do we hold those people that we elect accountable for following through with the, the promises and the actions they said they would take when they, you know, wanted to represent us? So those were the things that we discussed in our group. And then <laughs> when we came back to the room, we were just starting to talk about, well, what can we do about it? And that's when I, raise my hand to speak and we ran out of time, so. Thank you so much, Jessica. Steve or Jerry from your group, you are welcome to unmute yourself and share if there's anything additional that you would like to add. It sounds like you had a really great conversation in your group. Um, this is Steve and I, 
the, the little that I can add, because uh, Jessica did a good job of recapping what we talked about, but there is a need to be concerned about transparency. Um, and in doing that, um, there are a lot of people, and first, let me, let, me, let me preface this. There are a lot of good people in the Cedar Rapids, Marion area. I'm, I'm not discounting that. But there is a group of folks who, who only say the things they need to say to get elected, to get on a board, get on a commission, get their name somewhere. And then when they leave, they go off in their own little sheltered area of folks who are, look like them, talk like them, act like them. And that's who they really are. That's how their kids are gonna be raised. And so when the alarm clock goes off in the morning at seven, they get ready for work and now they've transferred themselves to this other person. And so we have that going on in this area. There are people who are not genuine. And the problem with that is that a lot of folks, people of color, people uh, with disabilities, people of gender, they see through that. So there is a lack of trust a lot of times that one has to deal with. And you need to have that because the whole part about this change is open and honest conversation. How do I understand what's going on? Just because you don't see it doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. And if I tell you it exists, it's how my perception and how I've interacted and you may never see it. So we really have to be open and then you need to communicate that with others who you run into. So, but anyway, that's all. Oh, Jerry had a pretty good point about some of the uh, activities that are going on and, um, and being part of that. So be, getting involved is, is a good thing, but you need to be sincere about it. Yeah, thank you, Steve. Uh, this is Jerry. Uh, what I pointed out was that people should recognize that to become stakeholders, and they all should want to be, realize the blueprints in front of the community right now. An example I used was the Safe, Equitable, and Thriving Community Task Force. It's a result of six years of progress toward goals, and the pandemic has really uh, put a crimp in all that, but maybe this is a breakout year and we can be become more um, acquainted with the, the challenges and, and become stakeholders in that. I don't wanna hog any more of the conversation, but uh, set safe, equitable and thriving communities. That's a good example. Thank you so much, Steve, Jerry and Jessica for sharing. Um, I have worked with Steve at the Marion Civil Rights Commission and Jessica, and I know that they are both very authentic in their um, desire to create equitable spaces for all minoritized communities. And I agree that um, we need to hold each other accountable. Again, that goes back to whether or not we see ourselves as an activist, an ally, or an advocate. Um, so thank you guys for sharing that. Um, you know, and it is key. The framework is there for us. It's, we just need to be willing to, um, step into that space and as we've said before hold other people accountable so some of you have responded to our final polling question which is what is something you are committing to future um, to further your learning or take action on regarding equity and social change and i love to see these responses again to take a step back and make space for folks who have been marginalized um, direct lobbying on some concerning current legislation, uh, being able to follow up uh, on a letter that you wrote. Again, I think the uh, message here is accountability, not only for the people who we are asking to be a force of this change, but certainly to ourselves, right? Um, to read and get involved, to promote different community engagements, um, lifting up voices who don't naturally receive the mic. Um, I think that I, before we pass it over to Stephanie, um, if any of you guys were following along in the chat, Ashley, um, Councilman or Councilperson Van Orney had to leave a little bit early, but I think she put it so well in that 
um, our advocacy, um, our allyship, or activism doesn't end at 8 p.m. tonight. We continue to uh, work for all of the change that we hope to see further um, in this community. So again, thank you all for participating um, in our polling questions um, and in each of our individual conversations. I will uh, pass it on to Stephanie to end with any additional parting words. Thank you, Angelica. Just another thank you to all of the people who participated tonight and any of the other sessions. And we do invite you to continue to uh, work in any way that you see fit to create um, equity in our community. Um, someone in my group mentioned it can just be a small, uh, small thing of who you're inviting to your conversations and having a bigger circle of concern, um, having a bigger we. And so we invite you to um, continue to have conversations with one another. Uh, we will be providing uh, additional opportunities in the future with between um, the different commissions and uh, feel free to reach out to us with questions. But again, thank you so much for your time and for sharing. Uh, we love seeing all of the participation and all of the questions and great um, dialogue that comes out of these. So thank you and stay warm. And Move on past eight o'clock. <laughs>